Cringham Cring Cring Roads here. The hailstorm actually came in off the Irish Sea, and there it is, just going through. What we're left with this morning is uh, low temperatures, the risk of ice, especially where we have seen showers, and there are a number of showers that continue to be draped near to coastal areas. Rain easing away from Shetland, followed by showers for the Northern Isles later on. Now, many of us will start off with the risk of ice, but there should be a fair bit of sunshine. But we are going to see some rain arriving today, but this rain isn't straightforward. There is some uncertainty about exactly uh, how far northeastwards it's getting. It will turn wet, though, for southern Wales and southwest England through this morning. The rain may not arrive across the northeast Midlands into parts of East Anglia and the southeast of England until after dark. So just bear that in mind. The weather might actually not be as bad here. For Northern Ireland, we'll see some wet weather around about the middle part of the day. For Scotland and northeast England, should stay fine with some sunshine. Uh, be quite cold, temperature about four or five degrees. Overnight tonight, again, there's a risk of icy stretches across northern areas where the clear skies will again allow a frost to develop in rural parts. Rain clearing away from England and Wales, but we're left with a lot of cloud. It'll be relatively mild, 10 degrees in Plymouth, but we've got that frosty weather across the north and east of the country. Now, looking at the weather in the week ahead, we're looking at an unsettled week with spells of rain. That's something we've really not seen very much of over the last few weeks. It's going to become windy as well, with severe gales possible towards the end of the week. The wind's often coming from the southwest, which is a mild direction. Monday's charts then, a lot of clouds, some mist and hill fog patches are probably turning damp for Northern Ireland, Wales and South West England. And after a fine sunny start to the day across northeastern parts of the country, probably clouding over a bit, mild towards the southwest, still got the cold air with us across parts of Scotland and northeast England. But eventually the milder air will be pushing in. As I say, we are looking at an unsettled week with a succession of weather fronts crossing the UK. Initially, those fronts will be quite slow moving, but later in the week, as the weather systems get bigger and more powerful, well, that's when we could see some severe gales rocking in towards the south of the UK in particular. That's how the weather's shaping up. Ben, Sally, back to you. Chris, good stuff. Thank you. More from Chris a little later. You are watching Breakfast from BBC News. It is exactly 17 minutes past seven. Time now for a look at the newspapers. Well, uh, Rabbi Laura Jana Klausner is here to tell us what's caught her eye. Very good morning, morning to ben. you. Uh, morning. There's a lot to get through, so yes. we delve straight in. Yes. And, and you've picked out the Telegraph for us this morning. Uh, perhaps unsurprisingly, a lot of news about Donald Trump. That's correct. So this is about how the, uh, the ban on refugees and, of course, migrants will affect UK passport holders. But I think what's so interesting in this is, the num is this fits into an overall strategy against Muslims. The idea of Muslims having to register uh, what I would call Muslimophobia rather than Islamophobia, because I think it's really about that, um, and how that happened on Holocaust Memorial Day. So you, the resonances of history are screaming out. And what's interesting now is that there's a movement, an international movement, for other people who are not Muslims to say, I'm going to register. So Madeleine Albright, the past Secretary of State, said, as a Jew, I'm going to register as a Muslim so that we show complete solidarity. It's a, it's a very, very frightening... And he would, he would, Donald Trump would deny he was anti-Muslim. Well, he's wrong. <laughs> That's all I can say. When you can deny whatever you like, but if you start bringing in laws very quickly and misusing your, your power the way he has, so he has supreme, not supreme, he has extensive executive power that feels supreme in the way he uses it. He comes in with a massively heavy hand legally. Let's take this issue to the side. How many executive laws are you going to make within the first week? What does that say about how you see democracy, how you see authority, authoritarian uh, rule? That's much more concerning. Slightly off subject, but, uh, you know, interesting considering your job. Did you pay any attention to how he marks National Holocaust Memorial Day? Yes, the words were fine. Right, OK. The words now, were absolutely, absolutely fine. Whoever wrote those words, right. well done. Right. But the actions are not. Right. The issue that many people will have with this is that he is doing exactly what he promised on the campaign trail. We're talking a little earlier with our guest about it as well, that it, it wasn't an unknown. It shouldn't be a surprise. He it's promised to do this. He is enacting that. And that's what people voted for, was it not? It, yes. But let's say you want you all concern. What's the fear behind it? The fear is about lives, economy, health, terrorism. Then you deal with each of those fears, and one of the ways is to look at migration law and refugee laws carefully. But to say within one week I'm going to blast it answers the fear or exacerbates the fear, but doesn't deal carefully with human rights and long-term solutions. Mm. Well, um, 
Let's move on now, timely, I suppose, to the um, Observer and the story you've picked out here about Theresa May's counter-terrorism bill. So this they is say it's on the verge of going away. And the reason it's on the verge of going away and connects exactly to Ben's question is because she's used these big words, extremism, British values, which we continue, but they are words that are very hard to define and are often used as a stick instead of a carrot. And Theresa May met with, uh, Professor, uh, with President Trump uh, on this week. Did she call him out on any of this? No. So I am very glad to say that what he is doing does not represent the majority of British people or consensus in Britain. And as our Prime Minister, I would expect her to raise hesitations. Mm. So that when we look back at history, the time that she met and the first foreign leader that he meets, she already is bringing those questions. Because she's seen in our own home in Britain, when you try and do laws that are so hammer, really, rather than help, uh, that they're very problematic and the idea of British values being a clear thing mm. it's it's very very hard to define um, another controversial issue uh, this is in the Sun this morning cancer drug bills saw by more than a thousand percent in five years um, and this the drugs firms raising the price because they know that they, they will get the money it's very problematic because the, I experienced this week in an NHS clinic a wait, we had 42 people taken for an afternoon slot for two doctors. There was a woman next to me uh, at 3.10, she was taken in and she'd been there for an 11.30 appointment. We waited nearly three hours for our appointment. It was rammed, it was, and the NHS needs love and care and budgeting. And when this is going on, it's very, very corrosive. Mm. Um, and I think we have time for one more story, and this is a story you picked out from the Sunday Times. Yes, so... A little just, bit more cheery. Well, it is a bit more cheery. Yeah. Also, I love it. It's about elephants um, and how elephants got in, from Africa across the sea by using their, their tail as a snorkel, or their trunk as a snorkel, which is a wonderful idea. And I <laughs> use, in all my meetings at work, I have an elephant on the table, and we're always saying, what is the elephant in the room? What is the unsaid thing? But here we have another wonderful thing about an elephant, which is not just the thing that's unsaid, but a super survival mechanism. So are you, uh, they have uh, the, their trunk shrank, has been getting smaller over the years, is that right? <laughs> to fit the size of a snorkel, apparently. Oh. <laughs> it's a, that's an excellent... things you learn. <laughs> the things that you learn, and also that give you inspiration yeah. and hope. Yeah. There are ways to deal with everything. There's a solution <laughs> for everything. Thank uh, you. Really nice to see you. And we'll you. talk to you a little bit later on. Lovely, thank you. Now, it uh, might be illegal. You don't have to look far, do you, to see drivers using their mobile phones at the wheel? No, sadly not. Uh, and if people aren't put off breaking the law, would it make more sense to confiscate their smartphones if they're actually caught in the act? Well, one police officer says it might be the only way to get drivers to stop using them at the wheel. Well, we'll hear from her in just a moment. But here's what the people in Manchester yesterday thought of that idea. I think it should be confiscated, yeah. I don't see any other way to stop them from doing it. Yeah. I think I'd probably have more of an issue in the fact that we were allowing the police to confiscate my own property. You know, understand proceeds of crime, but it's not proceeds of crime. I think that it would definitely act as a very good deterrent because just people would think twice about it because of the bureaucracy and the hassle of getting it back. Two seconds on the phone, you think about it, like it's two seconds they're not looking at the road and something will come along. So, I mean, it depends because. How are they going to confiscate it? How long for? Of course, because that's uh, affecting other people's lives, you know. The moment you put your phone out and start using it, you're going to cause someone to die. To be honest, I'm a bit addicted to my phone, so yeah, it would definitely make me think twice. Well, PC Jane Willett joins us now. Um, very good morning to you. Good nice morning. to see you. Um, so it seems that the threat of fine, maybe the threat of points on your licence, any other thing isn't enough to make us stop using our phones at the wheel. You want to see tougher sentences, tougher penalties. Well, I went to a conference on Thursday and hosted a National Roads Policing Conference and the big talking point at the moment is the change in legislation that comes on the 1st of March, which is an increase in the penalty points to six and the fine for £200 for a vehicle of car standard drivers. And um, we decided to put, I decided to put the comment out there, what do we think about harsher penalties? Should we go further than just that deterrence? Yeah. Um, and I'm quite surprised, I'm relieved at the, that the media input and pick-up that it's had. Yeah. So I'm for it, yes. How would you enforce that? 
really difficult because we are obviously we're always fighting our reducing numbers we've got less than 5,000 dedicated roads policing officers across England and Wales at the moment um, however we do have campaigns regularly we had one just this last week where we targeted specifically uh, road users who were using mobile phones whether it was a car or a lorry and we're waiting for those figures to come out this next week to see um, what what it's been like on the roads uh, and if you make a parallel with other things, for, for example, drink driving, it is now socially unacceptable to do that. Uh, many people agree they will accept that you don't drink and drive. How do we get to that point with a mobile phone? Because some would say it's actually even more dangerous to be using your phone than it is to be drunk behind the wheel. It's a question I'm asked quite regularly when I do these type of interviews. Do I think it is on par with drink driving? I say yes, it should be, mm. but we have got to change society. The enforcement has to go hand in hand with a really robust education system. We do offer an education programme. Some drivers don't get penalised by having fixed penalty notices. Mm. Some drivers are offered what's called a driver improvement scheme, where there is a financial cost to them, but it, it it means that once they've attended in their own time, they then won't get points on the licence. There is a tendency there, and a temptation, isn't there? You've got the phone in the car, it beeps, you maybe uh, you want to look at that message, it's an urgent message. You need to be looking at directions to go where you're going, you've got a map open on your phone. How do you get people to lock that phone away? Put it in the boot before you get in the car, for example. It's really hard because we've all become so reliant on what a phone, the phone, the phone isn't a phone like legislation came in to dictate about. A phone is a mini computer. It mm. does so many things. And I think we've got to have hard hitting, hard hitting evidence of casualty figures, show people what the risk is. And my message would be is no text message or social media message is worth risking your life or other road users because we're too easily distracted by doing a social social media update, mm -hmm. taking selfies, and it isn't just about people picking up the phone and using it in the traditional way, it's all these other things that are having a huge impact in distracting drivers. And unfortunately we've seen the evidence all too many times, haven't we, in the newspapers, but newspapers people being killed, um, people getting, into, getting seriously injured in road traffic accidents that have happened as a result of people using a mobile phone. Absolutely, and one life lost in this way is one life too many, and I don't think people realise the consequences of looking down at the phone for that two or three seconds while they scroll through to choose a tune or take a, send a text message, that distraction can be catastrophic and we've seen that. I was driving on a motorway yesterday behind a big lorry that was weaving in the middle lane like this, like this and I thought, oh my goodness, this driver's falling asleep here. I overtook to get past him. He wasn't asleep, he was texting. And sadly, uh, people see this all the time, but yeah. we're now getting members of the public now who are willing to report other drivers. Mm. Yesterday I was on um, Twitter looking at updates to do with this message yesterday and there were motorists on there actively putting vehicle registration numbers on Twitter and reporting to the police. Mm, that's a whole other thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Jane, have to leave it there. Uh, thanks very much. PC Jane Willett, good to talk to you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks very much. Now, the Andrew Marr programme is on BBC One this morning at nine o'clock. Andrew, what have you got for us? Well, a lot of controversy overnight about Donald's travel, Donald Trump's travel ban on millions of people from Muslim countries. Who will be affected by this? I have one example, the Tory MP, Nadim Zahawi, who's going to come in and talk about his feelings about being excluded from America if this goes ahead. I've also got the Cabinet Minister, David Gork, on the same subject and Brexit. Plus, in the leader interviews, Tim Farron of the Liberal Democrats. And finally, looking back on more than 30 years at the heart of Labour politics, Harriet Harman. All of that, plus the actor Matthew McConaughey. A busy hour after nine o'clock. Sounds it. Andrew, thank you. Uh, and coming up in the next half hour on this programme, we'll have all the latest on those protests in America. Do stay with us. The headlines are coming up. Somewhere waiting for me. <laughs> My lover stands Hi. on golden sands and watches Hi. the ship oh, yeah. that go sailing somewhere. Watch your little ones discover CBB's Playtime Island, the app for games with all their CBB's friends. Free to download now. Hello, this is Breakfast with Ben Thompson and Sally Nugent. Uh, coming up before 8, Chris will have all the weather for us, but uh, at exactly, or oh, just approaching 7.30, uh, here's a summary of this morning's main news. American civil liberties campaigners have won a...